Let's go to our Sunday School lesson. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, again. Now, this is two days before Christmas, and I thought about <clears throat> preaching my standard Christmas lesson on why Christ was not born on December 25th, and give you the scriptural evidences for that. We've done that so many times, anyone could probably find it on our uh, church website if they wanted to learn it. I was even going to title it, Pastor Shrive Ruins Christmas. <laughs> But I decided not to do that. We'll just go to our, our ongoing um, lesson in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. And let's read verses 7, 8, and 9 once again. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. The doctrinal implications of this part of the Bible we've tried to make clear. This section is aimed at someone after the rapture who finds himself in the tribulation, whose salvation now depends upon uh, his faithfulness and a measure of good works. It's no longer by grace alone, through faith alone. And um, just because the word salvation occurs in verse 9 doesn't automatically mean it refers to the salvation of a soul or a sinner like you and I are saved. And I talked about this last week. Salvation is used, or the word saved is used, in a number of contexts with a number of different definitions throughout the Bible. Um, however, Paul's language in verse 9, things that accompany salvation, can certainly be applied to us for our spiritual and devotional benefit. And so I want to talk about that for a little while. Some things should accompany every sinner's conversion in this age. And the main thing that accompanies salvation uh, today is belief in the Bible. That should be the one of the, the main thing that comes when a sinner turns to the Lord Jesus. Bob Jones used to say he never met the Catholic or the Jew or the atheist for that matter who, who once he turns to Christ didn't suddenly believe all the Bible to be true. And that's an amazing phenomenon that Suddenly, you don't doubt the Bible. Suddenly, you want to believe it. And you do believe it. But uh, we read, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. The scriptures are the, the medium through which a sinner finds Jesus Christ. Go, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and a great verse that every Christian ought to be familiar with, if he doesn't at least memorize, if he doesn't memorize it, at least be familiar with it. Paul writes in verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The only way the word of God will work effectually and be effective in the life of any Christian is for that Christian to believe what he's reading to be the words of God. If you don't believe that, it won't work. It won't do anything for you. I remember as a teenager, teenager my dad would always preached the King James Bible, but we weren't aware that there was any kind of an issue going on, that there was some sort of a corruption of the Bibles, that that's the Bible he was uh, saved under and preached and was taught in Bible school. That's the only one I had ever been exposed to growing up. Then we had a guy that was our youth director for a while, and he thought he was going to help, about, help us young people out. He gave all, all of us a, a New American Standard New Testament. And... Uh, and still, we had no idea that there was any issue 
uh, at stake there. <clears throat> but, you know, I read some of it, and some of the language sounded a little more contemporary. I thought, well, maybe this will help me understand it. But I didn't read that one any more than I was reading my King James Bible. I was neglecting both of them. And uh, it didn't, once I, I give credit where it's due, I have to credit uh, Dr. Ruckman's preaching and the sermon, the sermons the guy gave me on cassette tapes of, by him, uh, that unless you believe what you're reading to be the word of God, how can you expect God to work through it and, uh, and, and, and teach you along the way? And so, when I came to decide that I'm going to believe everything in this Bible is the Word of God, every word there is the Word God wants to be there, that's the vocabulary He wants me to read, to see, to think about, to memorize, I'm not going to change a thing in it, I'm going to trust all of it to be right. Yes. Now, it's the Holy Spirit's job to start teaching it to me. He's the ultimate teacher. Little by little as you go. Now once I, once I agree that what I'm about to read are the words of God with no need for correction, I don't have to change it, all I have to do is believe it. Suddenly things began to open up to me. I'd read through the Bible, I couldn't get enough of it. I was gobbling it up as much as I could. Uh, my dad used to give the challenge to read three chapters of the Bible every day, five chapters perhaps on Sunday, and you'll complete your entire Bible in exactly one year. So I took that challenge up. I read through the entire Bible in a year. For the very first time in my life, I was about, I was about 22, 23 years old. And it was so good. I saw so many things in there. I, I didn't know the Bible talked about that. There's a story of a guy in the Old Testament. You know how all of you, uh, all of us have put the pillows under the blankets to make someone think that, that we were in bed under the covers, but we weren't? There's a guy that does that in the Old Testament. King David. And all kinds of things. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, I didn't know the Bible mentioned that or that was found in the scriptures. So I decided, I figured out how many chapters do I need to read to go through the Bible twice in a year. And if you read eight chapters of the Bible every day of the week, you'll complete the entire Bible twice in one year mm -hmm. with 25 unused days left over. You, might, you know, you may be sick, you might miss a day, or, or late for work, and so forth. And uh, so I did that the next year, read it through twice. And then I thought, well, what about three times a year? And if you read the Bible, three, read ten chapters of the Bible every day of the week, you'll complete the entire Bible three times in a year with eight unused days remaining. So I did that the next year, read it through three times. That was about the fifth time through, I was working for Focus on the Family. They were in Pomona. And uh, Lord, forgive me for that. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But I was working there early in the morning. I'd get there, wave to the security guard about 5.30, quarter to 6, go into a conference room in my department, uh, turn on the pot of coffee, make for myself, and just sit there at the table reading my Bible before anyone else showed up for work. I'd get a good hour and a half uh, sometimes two hours, depending on uh, what time I arrived, just reading through the Bible. And I uh, got through, got into Second Timothy, where Paul or Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, he says that I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith, and so forth. And he says the time of my departure is at hand. And I suddenly got emotional. I didn't want Paul to go. I didn't want Paul to die, be taken off and executed. And all of a sudden, and I, all of a sudden, I caught myself. I actually went like that on the table. I realized this happened two thousand years ago. Why am I emotional about it now? I get emotional telling you the story. But First Corinthians six seventeen tells us, "He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit." You and I are bound to each other because of the work of the same Holy Spirit, the same forgiveness of God, the same new birth by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, our names are in the same land book of life with each other. And uh, 
you and I are joined together with every Christian who's ever been saved before us, and us and them, uh, and every believer all the way back to that dying thief on the cross next to the Lord Jesus at Calvary. And we're all in the same body of Christ collectively. We all together make up the bride of Jesus Christ. And uh, there's no break in continuity. There's break, no break or division be between us and them, depending on the, the generation and the, the century that each of us lived in. They're all part of the same body of Christ. Some have died. They're in heaven now. And the rest of us are still here. But we're all part of the same body. And uh, you and I are, are in the same body with the Apostle Paul, with his disciple Timothy. And so when he writes those things to us, you can't help but put yourself in Timothy, Timothy's place. And the Word of God had this ability to reach out and grab me and pull me into the story. I was no longer simply a passive reader and a passive observer. I was now part of it. It spoke to me. And I had to tell myself, this happened 2,000 years ago. There's no reason I should be crying about it now. But the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is alive. And... Um, and if you don't realize that, it'll never bear the fruit in you that God wants it to bear. It'll never be uh, as effectual in you as God wants it to be. And so, but when a man gets saved, one of the things that accompanies his salvation is uh, he, want, he tends to believe what God said to be true. He wants to believe all the Bible to be true. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 tells us that charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So when you read something in the Bible, you say, that's absolutely right. I don't care what anyone says. People that uh, think they understand human nature, they don't understand the truth of that verse, um, are simply inept. They're, they're uninformed. And uh, also, um, a fear of sin ought to accompany a Christian's salvation. A saved man is twice as scared as committing sin uh, as an unsaved man is, the truth be told. And uh, look at what we'll read later in Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 12 Verses 5 and 6. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Quoting from uh, Psalm or Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. That is, the fear of God spanking you uh, ought to keep you on the straight and narrow. Ought to keep your life clean. Ought to keep your heart pure. Ought to keep your thoughts pure. The intentions and the motivations of your, your heart. And the reasons you do things. The reason you say things. The places you go. The people you're with. The activities you're willing to engage in. All of those things ought to be brought under the control of the idea that I might suffer the, the punishment of God if I disobey him, if I fail him, if I disgrace the Lord Jesus, if I'm an embarrassment to God. I don't want to be an embarrassment to the cause of Jesus Christ. I don't want God to say, you know, that guy is, a, is just wasting our time. Why do we keep putting up with that guy? I don't want him or the Lord Jesus or the Holy Spirit to see me and think those things. Lord, why are you patient with strive? He's just a failure uh, just about every time he gets a chance. You don't want to live that way. You don't want to be that kind of person because uh, whom the Lord loveth, he says, he chasteneth. him. That's a spanking. I am, I, I'm going to say this, knowing that my dad and mom are in the room right now. When my wife and I were newly married, had been married maybe a year or two, and then one of those times come up where I wasn't being as kind or nice to her as I should have been. And my dad caught wind of it. And I don't know if he even remembers this, but he came to talk to me. And um, when your dad talks to you, you, 
you know you've been talked to. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm telling you right now, we've been married almost 35 years in a couple of months. I am just as afraid right now of my dad coming to kick my backside for mistreating my wife or being a bad husband or a bad father uh, as I was 30 years ago. And I'm, I, because he, he wouldn't be fooling. He wouldn't be playing with it. He would mean business. My dad would turn me upside down, put a foot in each armpit, and use me as a pogo stick. That's what how, that's how he treated me. If you ever <laughs> thought I was out of line, and I am just as afraid of him disciplining me as a 58-year-old man as uh, I would have been if I was 8 years old or, or 17, 16, 18 years old, long in there. And the fear of God punishing you or disciplining you ought to be a thing that motivates you to live right for God. Yeah. To live a clean life for Jesus Christ and for his sake. But the fear of sin ought to accompany salvation. And also some degree of repentance ought to accompany salvation today. It may not be complete. Some people, I was talking to someone recently about uh, in other countries, with missionaries that we support, they go to places that are remote, uh, oftentimes places where not a whole lot of Western civilization is reached. People haven't heard the gospel of Christ yet, or they don't have a lot of the sophisticated modern technology that we have and we enjoy. Uh, now, those places are fewer and fewer, but still they exist. And uh, It may be in those places, they hear the gospel of Christ, they can understand they're a sinner, and they can respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many times, uh, missionaries will go as a medical missionary to provide medical help and, and medical assistance where it's needed as a way of opening the door so they can also off offer them the gospel of Christ. And so that's a legitimate uh, way to get your foot in the door because you're also a physical blessing to them along the way. <clears throat> but over here in America, we got so many people that have dissipated themselves because of alcohol, drug use, bad decisions, bad marriages, bad relationships, uh, failed employment here and there, and so that uh, their hearts are hard, and um, they're not eager to receive the gospel. They're oftentimes very hostile to the gospel, you get a bit of reception from people who are living in more despicable conditions because of war and famine and bad government and so forth than you do here in the United States. But people who ruin their lives in many ways, and they spend 25 years doing so, um, they might have a whole lot of things, a whole lot of baggage that can't be repented of overnight. Things that aren't going to get right in 48 hours after getting saved. But uh, repentance seems to come in, the best I can understand, it seems to come in two phases. First of all, do you have some measure of hatred and disgust for the things you used to do? You certainly ought to. And um, we don't tell somebody to, you know, count your many sins, name them one by one, when they want to trust Jesus Christ. Uh, and anyone that thinks that, uh, that uh, someone hasn't sufficiently repented yet, so I don't know if they're saved or not. That's somebody that wants to set themselves up as the judge yeah. of that other person. You don't know what's um, stirring in their heart and their conscience between them and God. And uh, if they show some measure of remorse, they, they understand that what I've been doing before was wrong. And I don't want to do it anymore. And, I'm, and I can freely admit my guilt for being a sinner. And God, help me to repent, help me to change what needs to be changed in my own life and conduct. That's the first stage of repentance. The rest of it is an ongoing repentance over the rest of your life that little by little God reveals something new to you. Right. Through prayer, Bible study, fellowship with the other Christians, you say, you know what? I want to be more like that, that lady at church. She has certain things, and I have certain things I should get rid of in my life so I can be like her. I admire her, or I admire that man, if that's the case. And uh, or 
what that preacher said was right. I ought to take that more seriously. And uh, little by little, certain things drop off. They fall by the wayside as you draw closer to the Lord Jesus and uh, learn from uh, other Christians who have your best interest at heart. They want to help you. They want to encourage you. And little by little, your life begins to change. You begin to bear fruit. Suddenly, uh, that old temper you used to have no longer controls you. Suddenly, the four-letter words that used to come out of your mouth like nothing, uh, they fall by the way. You said, realize suddenly, I can't talk that way anymore. If the, the Savior you're trusting is pure and perfect and lovely and virtuous and clean and without any defilement, you want to be like him. Amen. And little by little, you, you repent of one thing. Next month, you might have to repent of something else. And these things fall by the wayside and they get replaced with things that are more pleasing in the eyes of God. Yeah. But uh, somebody that says uh, you need to sufficiently repent fully before you get saved, that's like uh, expecting some Catholic to go in and tell the priest everything he's done. He can't name them all. The Lord Jesus didn't tell the, the thief on the cross next to him to repent, and name all his sins. Paul the Apostle didn't uh, press somebody to re and require them to do all those things. So, nor can we. But uh, some measure of repentance usually accompanies their salvation. They're sorry for their sin. They don't want to continue in sin. They want to change their life with God's help and the Holy Spirit leading. But there'll be some measure of hatred and disgust toward the things that you used to do because now you see them as wrong. Paul gives his testimony to King Agrippa saying, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, Acts 26 verse 10. And he was ashamed of that. Uh, I want you to go back if you will to the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and notice there verse 21, Paul says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There will always be some element of turning away from the old things, the old beliefs, the old habits, the old practices, the old customs, <laughs> uh, and turning to the things of the Lord. Paul commended the believers in Thessalonica saying, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living God, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. And uh, another thing that accompanies salvation is a real desire, a real thirst for the plain teaching uh, of the Bible. <clears throat> plain teaching and plain preaching. The average Christian doesn't uh, care at all about what the Hebrew word for this was, or what the Greek word uh, in the original mm -hmm. meant. Mm -hmm. You know what he cares about? He cares about what it says in the English Bible right in front of his face. Mm -hmm. You can go down to the Union Rescue Mission. There are guys that have ruined themselves. They're on skid row because of alcohol or who knows whatever other crimes they're, they've been involved in. They're looking for a, a meal and a place to sleep it off for the night. And the thing that keeps that guy awake at night is not uh, some discourse, some debate in a college uh, seminary classroom, but the book he finds waiting for him in that room, mm -hmm. the Bible that that preacher preaches. And uh, so he doesn't worry about Greek and doesn't want to either. We studied New Testament Greek for three years in Pensacola Bible Institute. And during that third year, we also doubled up uh, comparing about 26 different translations and how they render certain uh, Greek clauses in verses uh, to say completely the opposite of what the King James Bible says in many cases. And after four years of that, and also a year of Hebrew grammar, which is just enough to get you confused. In Hebrew is very difficult. So after all of that, all of that was intended to show the student 
that the English Bible he's holding in his hand is the Word of God from cover to cover and doesn't need to second guess it at all. But uh, <clears throat> another thing that accompanies salvation is a, a real desire for the plain teaching, the plain preaching of the Bible. Um, all these big TV ministries with uh, thousands of members attending who concentrate on <clears throat> fixing your marriage, they all uh, presuppose that your marriage is in trouble. So they always have these seminars or the series of sermons about your marriage uh, or our family life ministries. You know. Some of that passive, silly, pansy, faggot sounding talk, our, yeah. fam our family yeah. life ministries. Yeah. Our family life center. Yeah. It's just... Campus. Oh, it's just like, you you know, pick your feet up. It's getting pretty thick in here. Um, I need hip waders. There's so much... Oh, never mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Positive thinking sermons like Joel Osteen preaches. How that guy preaches the same positive thinking sermon 52 weeks out of the year... And everybody thinks they're getting something different each week. It's the same slop every single week. Slop. And he's got, I think, 40,000 people can fit into that church building of his, that sports arena that they turn into their church. All that is is a testimony to the fact that most of those people probably aren't saved. Because if they ever heard anyone preaching hard against sin and uh, naming sin and naming sinners and pointing out wickedness in society and a multitude of things they're probably guilty of, they'd, they'd run the other direction. No. But when you get saved, suddenly, um, uh, Psalm 119 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing mm -hmm. shall offend them. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you have broad shoulders, you have thick hide. You're not going to be set off like uh, some social justice warrior or, or a <laughs> snowflake that can't handle hearing some opinion that they've never been exposed to before. Yeah. <laughs> we got two or three generations now of people uneducated by the public school system who are so touchy, sensi, uh, sensitive, feely, um, that uh, they can't handle you having a contrary opinion to theirs. But a genuine believer suddenly has a hunger to learn more. He wants to get as much of the Bible as he can. Also, a desire to have fellowship with other Christians should accompany someone's salvation. It's good to be with the brethren. Uh, you and I draw strength from one another. God has so constituted us that we want to be with other people who have the same faith, who know the same Savior, who are trusting in the same shed blood of Christ, who are depending upon God's grace alone to cover their sin and their need for salvation who are trusting in the same Bible and have fellowship with each other because of that. Like-minded believers and uh, who are on the same page, as it were, with uh, the doctrines of God, the doctrines of the Bible. There's strength in numbers, that's true, but there's also strength with being, uh, in being with other Christians who have the same outlook, the same convictions, wherever you can, wherever you can. Galatians 6 Verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, Christ said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Excuse me. But you can't do those things if you don't meet with one another. You need to be with them. They need to be with you. I need to be with you. you I trust you need to be with me. We grow closer to God together. We read the Word of God together. We pray together. We sing songs of praise together. We can share testimonies and offer uh, our prayer requests, knowing that the brethren have our best interest in mind. They're going to care for us. They're going to pray for us. And if they're able to help, they're going to step in and try to help us, if they're able to do so. But you and I can't do those things on our own. The Bible says, uh, Romans 14, about verse... Seven. So then, um, so that no man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. You can't go your Christian life all on your own. You need to be with the brethren. I get phone calls a lot. Now, a lot of guys watch our YouTube ministry. Most of them are watching Gene Haw's sermons. But every once in a while, someone will 
call and or they'll uh, I'll get a text or an email and they're looking for a, a King James Bible believing church where they live and <clears throat> they've watched our sermons and uh, they, they like what they hear and so I said you know what I'm not sure about where you live but let me do some checking so I'll call the bookstore in Pensacola and ask if they because they have a list of former graduates and where they may be preaching or where missionaries are or I'll call the, the Bible Baptist Missions Board and ask where some graduate may be, if that graduate's in Australia, that graduate's in Canada, or someplace near where the person lives, I'll get the information, I'll get the contact uh, information, the name of the pastor, the name of the church, and I'll call that person back and I'll say, listen, here's some information, this guy believes what we believe, his personality is going to be different than ours because no two people have the exact same style, but um, he believes what we believe and will preach what, what we preach. And I'll give him the information. And on several occasions, I get the same response. After I've done all that work, well, you know, for right now, I think I'm just going to watch the Internet. Aye, aye, aye. Um, a guy bought a copy of my book last year. He lives in uh, New York, in Brooklyn. And um, he texts me quite regularly with questions. Although we had never spoken to each other, just texting for the last, I don't know, seven, eight months. And uh, so the other night I actually, I called him. I actually spoke to him on the phone for a little bit and asked him where he was attending church. And uh, he said really he, he wasn't. There was uh, someone who was sort of his pastor, but they didn't really have a place to meet. And they would meet once in a while and his pastor moved away. And so he just watches us on the internet, watches Pastor mm. Gina on the internet. And I told him, listen, do your very best to find some church that you can drive to. I know there are some PBI graduates in New York City. Find some place where the guy is going to be preaching the same Bible, preaching the same gospel, and is a Bible believer, and be a part of a local uh, assembly of other Christians. You need to be with other Christians. Yeah. And um, so that's the downside of a lot of uh, people who just watch church on the internet. Uh, the internet can't hug you. The internet can't shake your hand. The internet can't visit you in the hospital if you're sick. The internet can't pray for your sick loved ones, your, your unsaved loved ones. You can gain a lot. You can learn a lot from watching sermons online. And, I, and I'm humbled by People who watch my sermons and they'll post comments under it, um, very grateful for hearing it, or they've enjoyed it, they learned something from it. And this thing's cutting out again. But um, you need to be with other Christians. So one of the things that should accompany salvation is a desire to be with other Christians. And lastly, something that should accompany salvation ought to be a desire to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Don't keep it to yourself. Get out there and take a chance to witness to somebody. And uh, Jack Chick and has made it very easy with Chick Publication, mm -hmm. Chick Tracks. You know, um, I think it was Campus Crusade came up with a track called The Four Spiritual Laws. And it's very poor artwork, too wordy. They tried to compare them. They tried to do what Chicks was doing with This Was Your Life. And they fell horribly short of Jack Chick's tracks. Chick's Tracks slogan is, Chick Tracks get red. That is, it. nobody's going to throw that cartoon down because it's entertaining. They're curious about what the story is going to say, what the story is going to do. So uh, tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Make some effort to be a witness to a testimony. Brother Manuel has been a great blessing uh, to me. Tell me about how his mom recently got saved. And last week we saw his daughter get saved. And he's been witnessing to uh, his neighbor, guys that he works with. It's just wonderful to see what God's doing and see what God's moving upon him to talk to people, trying to find their, the answers to their Bible questions. Now, let's return to our text. I'm going to try to move along real quickly. Return to our text in Hebrews 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which he has showed toward his name, 
in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Look forward at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James 2 and beginning at verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So you're going to see in the, the, the last nine books of the Bible, the general epistles, beginning with Hebrews through Revelation, that after the rapture and the tribulation, <coughs> salvation is no longer by grace through faith alone, like Hebrews or Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tell you. It now will be a combination of faith and works. And other verses we could read, which for time's sake I'm not going to do that. And then verse 11 in our text, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We've already considered this language back in chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And also verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And uh, that's going to be the end, not of someone's life, but the end of a certain period of time. Daniel's 70th week, according to Daniel 9, um, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and the great tribulation. Look at verse 12, and we're almost done. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I want you to observe that the word patience is defined for us Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, and this is the last place I'll have to go to. Revelation 14, verse 12, the word patience is defined for us as being faith and works. Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So all of the radio and internet TV preachers miss the cross references. They keep insisting yeah. that after the rapture of the church, <clears throat> salvation will still be by grace through faith like it is now. But that cannot be. If someone is saved in the tribulation the same way people are saved now, then there is no, there is no tribulation, really. Uh, it's just a continuation of the church age. If, this, if the plan of salvation is the same. So how do you justify the rapture? How would you justify the rapture for Christians today who don't have to face the Antichrist? Why are we exempt from that and just caught up to heaven and the people who get saved the same way after us do have to face the Antichrist? How would you justify the rapture then? The truth is a whole new dispensation will then take place where salvation is based upon the, your, a measure of faith in Christ and your degree of good works, keeping the commandments, as it says, not by grace alone. And so with that, I'm going to stop, and we'll come back to this section, and God willing, we'll get our microphone system fixed by next Sunday as well.